first time that Jam and I visited Masada, I came away with very mixed feelings mm -hmm. about what I saw there. And I wonder if perhaps many of you feel the same. Zionists often portray the Jews uh, at Masada as freedom fighters who preferred to experience death rather than allow themselves or their children to be sold into slavery. But as I reflected on the shocking events that transpired at Masada, I found myself deeply disquieted about what occurred there. Something just didn't seem right somehow to me. I had the feeling that these events were being spun for me in a certain way. And so I thought, well, how would a Christian look at the events of Masada? Well, I think from a Christian perspective, things look quite different. In Romans chapter 13, Paul commanded the Roman Christians to be obedient to the Roman emperor as a minister who was appointed by God to carry out his will. This is what Paul says in Romans 13, 1 and following. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Now, this was written to Christians living in the Roman Empire under one of the greatest military dictatorships in human history. And it's very interesting that Christians did not participate in the Jewish revolt in AD 66. Rather, they remembered Jesus' prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem in Mark 13. Jesus said, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, standing where it does not belong, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And that's exactly what the Christians did in the face of the impending Roman attack. They left the city and fled to Jordan in order to escape the destruction. And so the Christian church was not annihilated in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Meanwhile, inside the besieged city, the horrors that were described by Josephus were going on. Gangs of thugs terrorizing the uh, population and stealing food so that they could eat while helpless women were reduced to cannibalizing their own children in order to avoid starvation. The rebels that hold up at Masada continued to resist and rebel against Roman authority for a few years, but Roman power could not be, of course, indefinitely resisted. And what then happened at Masada, when you reflect on it, was not mass suicide as it's often portrayed. The people uh, did not individually kill themselves. It wasn't as though each person committed suicide. What happened at Masada was mass murder. Uh, parents slew their children. Husbands killed their wives. Neighbors killed their neighbors. Now, you might say, well, but this was voluntary. Well. Those children at Masada were not given a choice. The family heads determined that those children's lives were not worth living. Better to be dead than to live as a Roman slave. Those parents arrogated to themselves the role of God 
in presuming to know what the future held for their children, and they determined that their children's lives would not be worth living. And so they murdered their own children. Now, does that sort of thinking sound familiar to anybody? It is the same sort of reasoning that drives the demands for abortion on demand of the abortion rights movement. <clears throat> These children's lives are not worth living. They will grow up in homes where they will be abused or in poverty. Every child should be a wanted child. These children's lives won't be worth living. So better to end them now. The parents arrogate to themselves the right to say whether or not that child's life is worth living. And that everybody at Masada was not enthusiastic about this course of action uh, is evident in the fact that a couple of women and children hid in a cistern uh, and so lived to tell about it. And you can only wonder, I think, how many others in that group at Masada would have preferred to live and entrust their future to the providence of God. So as I think about it, I think Masada was not a sort of noble heroic act. Masada was a Jonesville, yeah. frankly. And I think it should remind us not to presume to take God's role into our own hands. Whatever the future holds, we entrust ourselves to the providence of God rather than to arrogate that role to ourselves. Now what about Qumran, which we also looked at today? Well, the monastic community that lived uh, at Qumran, I think, is an indication of the religious diversity of Judaism at the time of Jesus' day. Now, while these uh, scenes didn't have any direct connection with Jesus or with the New Testament, despite the film's intimations about John the Baptist, um, the Qumran sect, I think, does provide valuable background information about the Judaism of Jesus' day in the first century. And one very notable example of this, I think, is found in uh, Jesus' reply to John the Baptist in prison. You remember that in prison, John the Baptist sends his disciples to Jesus with the following question. Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? And the expression in that question, he who is to come, obviously harks back to John's proclamation, which is independently attested in both Mark and John, of him who comes after me. He who is to come harks back to this proclamation of him who comes after me. And John is asking, are you the one that I was proclaiming? Uh, is it in fact you who are to come, as I said, or shall we wait for another? And the credibility of this uh, passage historically is supported by the awkwardness of John the Baptist apparently wavering faith in Jesus. This is an application of what's called the criterion of embarrassment. This would be awkward or embarrassing to think that John the Baptist of all people was wavering in his faith and now doubting and needed to hear from Jesus whether in fact Jesus really was the coming one whose advent John proclaimed. And Jesus' answer to John is very, very interesting. It appeals to the signs that would accompany the establishment of God's kingdom in Israel. Uh, Jesus says, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have the good news preached to them, and blessed is he who takes no offense at me." Now the signs that are mentioned here by Jesus are a blend of prophecies from the book of Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 5 and 6, Isaiah 26, 19, and Isaiah 61 and verse 1. And this last prophecy, Isaiah 61.1, explicitly mentions uh, God's anointed one, which is Messiah. And that Jesus' contemporaries saw these signs as indicative of the advent of God's kingdom 
is evident from a remarkable passage found among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were kept by the Essenes at Qumran. And this is from uh, fragment 521, which was found in that fourth cave that our guides pointed out to us in the cliffside, uh, 4Q 521. The passage first predicts the advent of Messiah. It says, and I quote, for the heavens and the earth shall listen to his Messiah, and all that is in them shall not turn away from the commandments of the holy ones. And then it goes on to describe what the Lord will do at that time of the Messiah. And I quote, He will honor the pious upon the throne of the eternal kingdom, setting prisoners free, opening the eyes of the blind, raising up those who are bowed down, and the Lord shall do glorious things which have not been done, just as he said. For he will heal the injured. He will make alive the dead. He shall proclaim good news to the afflicted." End quote. Here we have associated with the advent of the Messiah exactly that same uh, pastiche of prophecies and signs that were listed by Jesus himself in answer to John the Baptist's question. And I think what this shows is that these signs were widely anticipated in the Judaism of Jesus' day as being signs that would accompany the advent of the Messiah. And that shows that Jesus himself, in giving this answer to John, thought of himself as the Jewish Messiah. So this is one of the most interesting uh, indications of Jesus' own messianic self-consciousness uh, that is attested right out of those Dead Sea Scrolls. So, even though the Qumran community has no apparent direct contact with the New Testament, still its scrolls do help to shed some valuable light on New Testament background and can help us to better understand the Gospels as we read them. Well, those were just a couple of my thoughts on what we saw today, and what I'd like to do now is to open the floor to you to share Something of uh, the highlights of this trip. What has been a highlight for you? Uh, at the table the other night, where when we were eating, we each shared what we called a wow moment. Uh, probably every one of us has experienced a wow moment at some time during this trip. Or maybe there's been something that was especially meaningful to you that you'd like to share. And so I want to just open the floor for anyone to stand up and share with us uh, one of the highlights uh, of this trip or what this trip has meant to you.